Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing type 1 activation of uh, endothelial cells. So we now have so far discussed how type 1 activation is going to lead to the production of the two vasorelaxant uh, molecules, prostacyclin and nitric oxide. We've also discussed how it's going to lead to endothelial contraction, which will allow um, the formation of an inflammatory exudate containing uh, plasma proteins such as the coagulation factors and the complement proteins, which are going to be involved in uh, helping contain and attack the staphylococcus infection, okay? And we're now discussing how we're going to actually recruit leukocytes, and in this first stage, we're just looking at neutrophil recruitment from the blood into the interstitial fluid. So we've discussed that we're going to um, cause the exocytosis of these viable pallade bodies, and by the way, there should be a dash in between there, viable pallade bodies, okay? And and this is going to put the previously se sequestered P-selectin um, onto the apical membrane of the endothelial cells. This will bind to the P-selectin glycoprotein ligand 1, the PSGL1, which is on the surface of the neutrophils, and this will tether the neutrophils to the endothelial cells. Now, there is another change which type 1 activation is going to produce, which also helps to tether the neutrophils to the endothelial cells. Okay, so we're now going to discuss this. Okay, so you remember long, long ago now, we discussed uh, the breakdown of phosphatidylcholine by uh, cellular phospholipase A2 here. Okay, and it produced arachidonic acid, which we then later converted into prostacyclin, and also this molecule lysophosphatidylcholine. I said we would come back to this molecule and discuss its role. Here, we are now going to come back to it. So, what are we going to do to this lysophosphatidylcholine? So, let me draw it out again. So, here is our phosphate group, and here's our choline alcohol attached to the phosphate group. Okay, so let's colour everything in the same colours as we used back then. So here's the blue, which is the choline. Here in pink is the phosphate group. Okay. Then we have in green the glycerol molecule. Okay. And then a single fatty acid now, because remember phospholipase A2 has broken the other arachidonic acid fatty acid off. So this is a molecule of lysophosphatidylcholine, and remember this is in the phospholipid bilayer of our endothelial cell. So lysophosphatidylcholine. So basically, what we are now going to do is convert this lysophosphatidylcholine into a platelet-activating factor. Okay, so we're going to convert it into a molecule which is called platelet activating factor. Okay, and platelet activating factor um, is going to have an almost identical structure to lysophosphatidate. It's still going to remain in the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the cell, and there it's going to have a role in tethering uh, the neutrophils. So platelet activating factor is often abbreviated to PAF for short, PAF. Okay, right. So, what are we going to actually do that's going to turn lysophosphatidylcholine into platelet activating factor? Well, basically, we're going to add another molecule onto this alcohol group that's now free on the second carbon of the glycerol molecule, okay? So, since we removed the arachidonic acid, we've got a free alcohol group off the second carbon of the glycerol molecule. We are basically going to esterify that alcohol group with an acetic acid molecule, okay? So let me just show you acetic acid. Okay, so this is the structure of acetic acid, okay? Uh, so um, basically, it's what would now be called ethanoic acid, but the old biochemist's name for ethanoic acid is acetic acid. So we are going to esterify this acetic acid onto that second alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, which is now free. And this is done by a enzyme known as platelet activating factor acetylase. Okay, so platelet 
activating factor acetonase, and you might think that that's a bit of a weird name for an enzyme that is supposed to be adding a phos uh, sorry adding an acetyl group onto uh, lysophosphatidate, but in fact this enzyme platelet activating factor acetonase is named after the exact reverse reaction, so it's actually capable of catalyzing the reaction both ways. Okay, so it, it's named, however, after this backwards reaction. It's named after removing the acetyl group from the platelet activating factor and turning it back into lysophosphatidate. Uh, sorry, lysophosphatidylcholine. Okay, uh, so therefore it's the platelet activating factor acetylase because it's removing the acet acetyl group. Okay, but it's also capable of catalyzing the forward reaction. So let me draw a little cartoon for this. So here now is the structure of our platelet activating factor. So here's the phosphate group, here's the choline still in blue, and now we'll draw a little square here to denote the acetyl group that's been esterified onto that second alcohol group down there. So the glycerol molecule is now in green, okay? Uh, the phosphate group is still in vivid purple. Uh, the fatty acid in the first position is still there, and it's in orange. The choline is in blue down here, okay? And then finally, in turquoise, we'll have the acetyl group here that's been esterified onto that second alcohol group. So this is this group here. Whoops. Okay, right. So that's how you create platelet activating factor. So in these activated endothelial cells, you will activate phospholipase A2 due to the calcium that's being released from the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, this phospholipase A2 will produce arachidonic acid and lysophosphatidylcholine. The arachidonic acid will be converted into prostacyclin, and the lysophosphatidylcholine will be converted into platelet activating factor. The prostacyclin will then go and cause uh, vasodilatation, and now the platelet activating factor is going to help the p-synectin to tether the neutrophils to the surface of the endothelial cells and therefore is involved in the uh, extravasation, which means uh, the taking of the neutrophils out of the uh, vascular system, so it's a good word, the extravasation of the neutrophils, so the taking out of the neutrophils from the vascular system into the interstitial fluid. Okay, and this p-selectin, along with the platelet activating factor, together they are often referred to as juxtacrine signaling, which just means that the two of them are working together. So juxtacrine signal. Okay, so they are going to tether these neutrophils to the apical surface of the endothelium. So let me just get another piece of paper and we'll continue this story. Right. Okay, so, what's going to happen then? So, we've got our endothelial cell here that has now undergone activation, okay? So here is our endothelial cell, and we'll need to draw this other one here. Now, let's say both of these endothelial cells, they've undergone activation. So they've undergone endothelial contraction, which means that there's a nice, na nice gap in between these two endothelial cells. However, it's not really wide enough for a cell to get through there yet, uh, but it is allowing the build-up of an inflammatory exudate containing the complement proteins and the coagulation factors. Then what we're going to get is neutrophils coming through the blood, okay, and sticking to uh, the endothelial cells, okay, and what will happen is that the uh, piece selectin uh, glycoprotein ligand, the PSGL protein, on the surface of the neutrophils. So on the surface of the neutrophils, this little box here is meant to represent the piece selectin glycoprotein ligand 1, okay, and then the little box on the surface of the endothelial cells represents piece selectin itself, okay. These will bind to one another, and in addition, 
the plate that's activating factor plays a role in tethering uh, these um, neutrophils to the endothelium as well. And I'll just add in the multi-nucleated um, nucleus, okay, uh, multi-lobed nucleus rather, okay, and you'll also have a plate that activating factor which I'll kind of draw like that. Okay, so this represents platelet activating factor, which is within the phospholipid bilayer of our activated endothelial cell. Okay, so these two things that have resulted from the activation of the endothelial cell are going to uh, tether neutrophils to the apical surface of the endothelial cell. Then what's going to happen is a process known as diapodesis. Basically, the neutrophil is sort of going to sliver through this gap between the two uh, endothelial cells. So it slivers through, okay? And this is a process known as diapedesis. Okay, right. And there are certain proteins in this crevice between the two endothelial cells that are on the surface of the endothelial cells, which are involved in helping uh, the neutrophil to diapodes in this way. So if I zoom in on this side of this endothelial cell now, two proteins that are very important that are expressed in this crevice uh, are, one is known as PCAM, which stands for Platelet Endothelial Cell Adhesion Molecule. Okay, so I'll label this one up. So this is, oh, specifically PCAM1. Okay, PCAM1 which stands for platelet endothelial uh, cell adhesion molecule. Okay, so platelet, and let me move this out a little bit. Right, so platelet endothelial, and then whenever you see CAM anywhere in biology, uh, it means cell adhesion molecule nearly always. Cell adhesion molecule. Okay, and specifically this is PCAM1, platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecule 1. So obviously if you take the initials of that, you get PCAM1. PCAM1 also has another name. It's also known as CD31, standing for cluster of designation or cluster of differentiation 31. Now you have another protein expressed on the surface of this crevice, and that's known as CD99. Okay, so CD99, cluster of designation or cluster of differentiation, whatever you want to call that, uh, 99. Okay, so we'll colour in cluster of designation 99, vivid purple, and we'll colour in PCAM1 in blue. So both of these endothelial cells will express PCAM1, or CD31, and CD99 in the membrane that lines this crevice between the two cells, okay, and these are very important in helping the neutrophil to get through the gap and sliver through, and it has to change its shape. It's kind of like a mouse, I always think, because mice are supposed to be able to fit through anything that a pencil can, and I always think that they must sort of alter their form to go through uh, a hole the size of a pencil, but ki that's kind of what it reminds me of. Okay, uh, so they sort of s sliver through like a snake, basically. Okay, and then once that's happened, you've got the neutrophil in the extracellular fluid, okay? And this process of neutrophil recruitment in this way, or neutrophil extravasation, that's probably a better word, or neutrophil recruitment is nice because it sort of gives you the message of the reason that the neutrophils are coming, that we're recruiting them to our cause, okay? So I'll put neutrophil recruitment rather than neutrophil extravasation. Okay, this process of neutrophil recruitment will be happening in both our capillaries and our, uh, whoops, sorry, you can't see this. It'll be happening in both our capillaries and our venules. So uh, in our venules, sorry, our venules are in blue and our capillaries are in turquoise. At these sites, you'll be getting neutrophils crossing the endothelium, crossing the basement membrane, and going into the interstitial space. So you're going to accumulate neutrophils in the interstitial space where the Staphylococcus aureus is, and they're then going to go and phagocytose the Staphylococcus aureus. And they're basically the first-line troops, the pawns. And I always think of um, 
the X-Men film where um, Magneto t tells one of his um, friends not to go forward and let the pawns go first. That's kind of what this is like. Um, the neutrophils are the pawns which are going in, charging in, and just the body will throw them at uh, the infection and it will save the better troops, the more powerful cells of the immune system for later. Okay, so in acute inflammation, you get neutrophils piling into the affected area. Okay, so let's now summarize the type 1 activation. Okay, so basically, we had histamine come and stimulate the H1 receptor on the basolateral membrane of our endothelial cell. We saw how this led to the endothelial cells producing nitric oxide and prostacyclin, and how this was very important in the arterioles because uh, those two molecules led to the relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle cells surrounding the endothelium, and therefore uh, you got vasodilatation, which increased the blood supply to the affected area. Okay, that led to the rubor and the calor, the redness and the heat. And I should say, why do you want to get increased blood supply to this affected area? Well, it's so that you can get more complement proteins, more coagulative uh, proteins, more neutrophils to this site. That's why we want increased blood supply here, so that we can bring in the troops, basically. Okay, uh, and uh, we then saw that another part of type 1 activation is that you get uh, the contraction of the, of the endothelial cells, okay? And this is activated by uh, the production of phosphorylated myosin light chain, which causes the contraction of those actin filaments that are attached to the tight junctions and the adherence junctions, which pulls the tight junctions and the adherence junctions apart and opens that gap between the endothelial cells. This occurs in the, uh, what's important, that it occurs in the capillaries and the venules, because then once you've got these holes in between the endothelial cells, uh, protein and fluid from the blood can then leave through that hole, and you get the formation of an inflammatory exudate, which causes the swelling at the area of inflammation, uh, or the tumour. And uh, also, this brings in coagulation factors and complement proteins and other proteins as well. Proteins of the innate immune system, which are going to attack the Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So complement proteins, we'll do an entire video on complement proteins. They uh, attack uh, bacteria. Okay, the coagulation factors are going to lead to the activation of the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways, uh, which will lead to the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, and then fibrin will assemble into fibrin strands, and you'll form a fibrin meshwork, which will contain the bacterial infection and stop it spreading. Um, okay, so that's the purpose of producing this inflammatory exudate. Finally, the endothelial cells will also um, recruit uh, neutrophils to the site of infection once they've undergone type 1 uh, activation. So they do this by um, putting P-selectin on their cell surface membranes, uh, whereas before it was sequestered in these viable pallade bodies, okay? And they also have platelet activating factor in their phospholipid bivalve. These form this juxtacrine signal, which then uh, tethers the neutrophils to the side of the uh, endothelium, so they stick to the apical membrane of the endothelial cells. And then what happens is the, uh, the neutrophils diapodes through the gaps that you formed in between the contracting, the contracted endothelial cells. Okay, and this requires those proteins PCAM1 or CD31, and also CD99. Okay, and then the neutrophils come into our site, and they will then uh, phagocytose the invading Staphylococcus aureus. So that completes our discussion of type 1 activation of endothelial cells.